listening now? Yeah. Okay. So everybody watch your language. <laughs> Can you see my screen or do you still see those black boxes? No? That's better. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay, here we go. What? Uh, you give it a couple of seconds, Kurt, before you start. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome everyone to our fourth session in the Mindful Modernisms webinar series. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kurt Esperson Peters and I'll be introducing the webinar session for today. These eight webinars form a series of cross-cultural and interdisciplinary discussions organized by Academic Initiatives, which is a collaboration between the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats, the Bachelor of Interior Design Program at Algonquin College, and the Department of Interior Design at the University of Manitoba for the promotion of critical mindful and contemplative approaches to design thinking, education, and practice. For the Mindful Modernism series, the discussions are centered on mindfulness as a mode of inquiry to challenge assumptions about modernism and the lingering search for modern forms that remain embedded and often invisible in our social, cultural, political, and economic structures. We are especially interested in the intersection between mindful modernism and modern mindfulness in our built and designed environments in terms of design thinking, education, and practice. The structure of the series is centered around the following questions. What are the assumptions and inheritance of modernism in our present context? Are these modern narratives still at play in our thinking, practice, and pedagogy? What does being modern suggest today? And can the application of mindful and contemplative approaches restructure design thinking, education, and practice to embrace unprivileged, marginalized, and excluded viewpoints? Mindful Modernisms will consist of eight webinar sessions, each with two distinguished speakers in a dialogue around modern and mindful themes. The speakers come to these sessions from a range of design and non-design backgrounds, including interior design, architecture, mindful and contemplative studies, art and design history, graphic design and representation, gender studies, psychology and sociology. The goal is to remove the speakers from their normal disciplinary and professional comfort zones and through discussion and dialogue, have them bring their insights and intellect to bear on generating new ideas and possibilities about modernism and mindfulness in the allied and non-allied fields of design and the built environment. We anticipate that these sessions will always be dynamic, generative and informative, both for the speakers and for the viewers. The series is supported by the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada and Interior Designers of Canada, and partially funded by the Ontario Association of Architects and a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. We also want to thank each of our generous presenters for their time and effort in making the series happen, as well as our numerous students, research assistants, and volunteers, Megan Foundfor, Ali Zamani, and Cameron Collins, who work tirelessly behind the scenes, and of course to all of you who for showing up this morning with your cup of coffee and your bowl of cornflakes, looking for a little bit of intellectual stimulation. So this series is curated by Pallavi Swaranjali, myself, and Roger Kano. Mindful Modernisms is part of an ongoing series of webinars, publications, studio and seminar courses, and exhibitions organized by academic initiatives and the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats on the investigation of critical mindfulness in design thinking, education, and practice. And for more information on our project or how to get involved, please contact us. And we will be placing the contact information in the chat window. I'll now pass off the introduction to today's session to Pallavi Swaranjali. You're muted, Pallavi. <laughs> 
Sorry. <laughs> uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome to our session today. And today I'm very excited to present uh, the speakers uh, who are here with us today. Our uh, first speaker will be Louis Komiati, who has a PhD in religious studies from Boston University. He is a leading independent scholar, educator, and translator. And he's the founding director and distinguished professor of unlearning at the Underground University. He researches and has published extensively in contemplative studies, Taoist studies, and religious studies following specific interests in contemplative practice, embodiment, and mystical experience. In addition to over 30 academic articles and book chapters, Dr. Komiati has published nine books to date. These include the more, more recent, Taming the Wild Horse, an annotated translation and study of the Taoist horse taming pictures, uh, published by Columbia University in 2017. Uh, and it's the first book to fuse animal studies, contemplative studies, Taoist studies, and religious studies. He's also published Introducing Contemplative Studies by Wiley Blackwell in 2018, the first and only book length introduction to the emerging interdisciplinary field. His current work explores cross-cultural practices and perennial questions related to aliveness, extraordinariness, flourishing, transmutation, and trans-temporality. He lives in semi-seclusion on the North Shore of Chicago, Illinois. Our second speaker today is Andrew King. Uh, Andrew is the Chief Design Officer at LeMay and leads fieldwork, LeMay's research and design collective. A pre Jerome laureate, fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, and professor in practice at the Peter Go Hua Fu School of Architecture at McGill University. He's a recognized leader in Canadian design practice, education and excellence. Responsible for the firm's design leadership and relevant national strategic initiatives, he has evolved a critically recognized practice model that converges speculative practice, creative thinking and academic research. It's, it's a great honor to have you both here, Luis and Andrew. And today, both of them will be discussing some very fascinating uh, topics. Um, the silence that Luis emphasizes is a contemplative silence that explores traditional practices that redefine the meaning of silence and an inclusive method that probes state of, states of consciousness nourished within possibilities of being. Komiati and um, King deliberate on how we think, experience, conceptualize silence and its relation to sound and noise. What traditional contemplative practices support such an act? How can certain spiritual and sacred themes like silence and darkness be defined differently by recourse to new cognitive and theological thinking? Are these omitted or highlighted as undesirable in modernist ways of teaching and thinking? Is there a new mindful modern to be considered? So on behalf of the cur curatorial team, we welcome you both. Uh, Roger sends his wishes from Stockholm. Um, and I will now hand it over to Kurt, who will be moderating the session today. Kurt, it's over to you. Thank you, Pallavi, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so we will begin today's sessions with presentations from both Lewis and Andrew. Afterwards, uh, we will have a discussion and dialogue based upon the presentation and also in response to the themes. I will be moderating and keeping things in order. And uh, we should uh, expect maybe about 45 minutes to an hour's worth of discussion and presentation for today. So without any further ado, I'll hand this over to Lewis, who will be presenting first. Lewis. Okay, thanks. So you can see that? Yes, we're good. Great, so I'd like to begin uh, by thanking the Canadian Center for Mindful Habitats, especially Kurt, Pallavi and Roger for the invitation and opportunity to speak to you today. My thanks also for each to each of you for being present. This is just to say, I've eaten the plums that were in 
the ice box and which you are probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So thinking about poetry in terms of a phenomenological unfolding and the syntactic anticipation involved in this poem by the American poet William Carlos Williams, how do we experience or create space in as through writing, the spaces within, between, around hearing? According to James Carse, who died in 2020, there are at least two kinds of games, finite and infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. Finite games are those instrumental activities from sports to politics to war in which the participants obey rules, recognize boundaries and announce winners and losers. The infinite game, there's only one, includes any authentic interaction from touching to culture that changes rules, plays with the boundaries and exists solely for the purpose of continuing the game. A finite player seeks power. The infinite one displays self-sufficient strength. Finite games are the theatrical, necessitating an audience. Infinite ones are dramatic, involving participants. So this involves risk, especially when working with materials beyond one's expertise. You have no authority. You're not authorized. Like visiting the pre-crime pre archives, searching for a minority report. Today, I want to move towards a new infinite game. This involves a different lens, a non-architectural lens, a frame beyond design narrowly defined. Today, I want to move towards an actual inter, multi, and transdisciplinarity, a new imaginarium, if you will, a place to the imagination, something visionary. Anthem the Iberian, who lived from 1650 to 1716, was a Georgian Eastern Orthodox theologian scholar. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that Eastern Orthodox Christianity has the Hezekast tradition or the stillness tradition. That's the con contemplative strain of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Um, for present purposes, what interests me about Anthem the Iberian is that he became an Ottoman Empire dissident. He was imprisoned, then he was exiled. Then he was assassinated on his way to exile. So he's one of the new additions to my pantheon of ex-beings for an alternate human history. He was too dangerous even for exile. How dangerous will we be or become? This is our home, which we affectionately refer to as the Red Bird Lodge in Highland Park, Illinois. Um, on the left is Dakota, uh, our dog companion, um, the main non-human resident here. Uh, his name means friend to everyone in Lakota. Um, so I want to think a little bit about lived architecture and living design. Um, this house was built in 1941 by the American architect John Van Bergen, who lived from 1885 to 1969. He was a contemporary and sometime colleague of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, they used local materials from a Wisconsin quarry. This house was acquired by us uh, with the assistance of my wife, Kate's late parents, including her father, Johnny Townsend, who also was a local architect and builder. And so there's an um, intersecting dream of home here. We're the third indwelling family, and I have deep gratitude to live here. What I appreciate about this house um, and as a space to welcome others into is the contemplative nature of it, its sighting, the surrounding ravine, the inside outside connection. There's a certain kind of Japanese style interior aesthetic. Um, it also frames the landscape so you can see the window behind me as well. This is a representation of Dakota's soundscape. So what are the sounds that our dog companion hears? Um, he's one of the most 
uh, Ware Beams, whom I've known. So this is my attempt to listen to him listening, to expand my own awareness. Um, I think about our daily shared rituals, um, the pre-walk sound markers that he has. So what does he listen for to know it's time to get up, that I'm moving, that we're about to move outward, that we're about to explore the world together. Um, and this is combined with his scentscape. So I'm grateful to Kate uh, for helping me develop this, but um, the intersection between sound and smell um, and we oftentimes think about this as being connoisseurs of wind. Uh, so the smell of seasonal changes. Um, this is one of the things I learned from him every time we go for a walk is when there's a season shift, he actually stops and smells the wind um, and kind of changes my perception of what's going on in the world. So on not being a dog, Right. I apparently am not a dog. And there's a famous Taoist story called the joy of fish. Um, and this is the story. Master Zhuang and Master Hui were strolling along the, the, along the banks of the Hao River when Master Zhuang said, see how the minnows come out and dart around where they please. That's what fish really enjoy. Master Hui said, you're not a fish. So how do you know what fish enjoy? Master Zhuang said, you're not me, so how do you know that I don't know what fish enjoy? Master Hui said, I'm not you, so I certainly don't know what you know. On the other hand, you're certainly not a fish, so that still proves you don't know what fish enjoy. Master Zhuang said, let's go back to your original question. You asked me how I know what fish enjoy, so you already knew I knew it when you asked the question. I know it by standing beside the Hao River. So I want to think partly through my relationship with Dakota in terms of an alternate, alternate or alternative or altered mode of being, the possibility of shared animality, or at least inner being, as well as sympathetic experiencing and learning. This relates to the question of the contemplative. I would think one of the reasons that you're here today um, so in my way of looking at this, uh, the contemplative refers to approaches and practices rooted in developing and expressing attentiveness, awareness, interiority, presence, silence, transformation, and a deepened sense of meaning and purpose. It may be religious, spiritualist, secular, or ecumenical. And the reason I put an asterisk next to attentiveness is that this is the kind of parallel concept to mindful. So in my way of thinking about this, this is a particular quality or mode of consciousness. It's more concentrated and we can contrast this with a kind of expanded awareness. So you can think through these questions on your own, but we might think about this in terms of something like watching a Buddhist walk versus watching a Taoist walk um, and the kind of quality of consciousness that's being manifest in and through the movement. Um, it's also important to emphasize that when we talk about contemplative approaches and contemplative practices, it's not necessarily religious or even spiritualist. So we can contrast this with what are referred to as religiously committed and tradition based contemplative practice. And that's one of my own areas of research and expertise. So what is contemplative silence? It's voluntary silence. It involves interiority and deep listening. So for the purposes today, we need to think about how to theorize silence, which sounds strange. I was talking to a number of friends and colleagues about the talk, They're like you're gonna go talk about silence? Maybe, or not exactly. But the relationship between silence and darkness and emptiness and the like, so not a conventional understanding of silence as absence or lack. Perhaps it's the field or space in which sound occurs, that which encompasses all sound. It's mysterious, beyond the known, the articulatable, the buildable, the comprehensible, the tameable, and so forth. It's traceless. But we have to contrast 
silence or contemplative silence with what I refer to as political silencing, which is involuntary and often forced. We need to recognize that there are diverse views of silence, as counterintuitive as that may sound, including the experience of and relationship to silence. For example, silence equals death, oftentimes invoked in the LGBTQ community, or silence equals complicity, sometimes invoked in Black Lives Matter. So we might think of public enemies bring the noise, the disruption of the silencing, the interruption of the silenced. But this is not homogenous. There's a larger question and project required here about these competing or intersecting ideas about silence. That is, we need to think about the phenomenon of being silenced, the history of exclusion, marginalization, oppression, and even vilification. That's a different talk, but who is given access and opportunities to social space and what types of spaces do they or we occupy? So this is about social engagement and social justice. And there's a current reckoning with potentially apocalyptic outcomes. This also might be connected to crypt theory, that is disability studies. And here I'm thinking specifically of the importance of the deaf community. Um, one thing that I'd like to do is have a conversation with members of the deaf community about their experience of silence. Um, thinking about other silenced individuals and communities. I've already attempted to speak on behalf of one Siberian Husky person whom I try to care for, listen to, and learn from each day. But contemplative silence is not just about questions of human vocalization. It has a theological dimension from my perspective. And when I say theology here, I don't mean Christian theology. I don't mean discourse on God. Um, but as you can see from some of the titles, I'm not sure if you're aware of these books, there is a Catholic connection in some of the more profound explorations of silence. So the relationship, for example, of Picard to um, Merton. Um, there's an inner tradition inside of Catholicism that has talked explicitly about contemplative silence. Um, and here I would just note that most of the so-called new atheists are more Christian than their Christian counterparts. And why do I say that? Because there's rumination about God and argumentation about God without consideration of the possibility of something beyond the conception of God. Um, also, the book A New Silence by Beverly Lanzetta is connected to a movement called the New Monasticism, which is a lay contemplative movement trying to think about the possibility of monasticism as a way of life. And part of the reason to put forward this view is to suggest that silence, especially this kind of silence, contemplative silence, is necessary for human flourishing, especially in the form of wild places. Also, it's about space. So if we look at the covers and the way that silence is being represented on these covers, it's this attempt to represent the unrepresentable. These are two of the more important and powerful contemplative spaces that I've visited um, in my life. On the left is the St. Francis of Assisi Shrine in Assisi, Italy, and on the right is the Rothko Chapel in Houston, Texas, in the United States. Um, one thing, one reason to put this up is to have us think about space. Um, my experience of the St. Francis of Assisi Shrine is also connected, even though it's empty here in the photograph, um, the number of pilgrims that go there and the contemplative silence being cultivated and inhabited by those individuals. And on the right, even though these are paintings that were commissioned by Mark Rothko, um, the space itself was created through the involvement of the local community to try to create an ecumenical religious space. So like nature and wildness, this is not about the absence of human beings.
Old Pond, Frog Leaps, Kerplunk. So this is a famous haiku by the Japanese poet Matsuo Basho, who lived from 1644 to 1694. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about these types of poems is the relationship between space and time, present moment awareness, this linguistic approximation of something happening and perceptual experience. How does this poem approximate the actual experience of this moment? Old pond, frog, leaps, kerplunk. So one of the more interesting discussions about contemplative space, especially contemplative silence, appears in Teresa of Avila's The Interior Castle, where she maps out this interiority in these stages of contemplative practice and the contemplative path in terms of these seven um, mansions. So these dwelling places that we can find within ourselves, 
a contemplative spatiality. Thinking about cognitive architecture or an interior contemplative space. And in my way of thinking about this, this relates to mindscape intention manifestation. So the relationship between these dimensions of ourselves. So what is the relationship? Thinking about consciousness and design or built space as reciprocal and co-creating. And this is partly derived from a critique of Sartre's critique of dialectical reason that was published in 1960. And here Sartre talks about freedom as material expression. That is the way that we manifest our freedom is through production and world reconfiguration. But I want to suggest that something else is possible. Restoration, some being over making and restructuring. So these are partial blueprints for a cattle slaughterhouse created by Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is an American animal behaviorist, a livestock quote unquote consultant and an autism spokesperson. And she talks about this as a processing center quote unquote intended for more humane slaughter, whatever that might mean. She talks about autism and the relationship between a cow's eye view quote unquote and thinking about the possibility of translating animal experience through autism. So this is debatable um, and open for discussion at another time, but here I present it to you as a possibility of unsilencing non-human suffering. Here it's a counterpoint. What types of design and architecture have we not and do we not want to discuss and encounter, let alone inhabit? the consequences of design. So if you're interested in this contemplative inquiry, you can look at the design and violence curatorial experiment on MoMA's website and the accompanying book by Paola Antonelli. These are photographs of zero one or the machine city on the left from the matrix and a modern Russian apartment complex on the right. Thinking about human warehousing and urban landscapes. What is the purpose of human being? What is the purpose of architecture? How do these relate? I think it's also instructive that in the matrix, the architect, quote unquote, with an uppercase A, is the creator of the matrix and the chief administrator of the system, holding one in non-place. The designs we find ourselves in, architecture as what is done to me, Drawing upon the previous installments of Mindful Modernisms, I want to pick up Luchin's pencil, turn it around, and erase the blueprints of identity and the boundary markers and grids that divide us. Inspired by the wall house, I develop my own design, gather local materials, and consult local craftspeople to build a new type of residence in which all beings may flourish. In the endless house and endless theater, I imagine conceptual architecture that cannot be built and will not be built, the unbuilt beyond the imagined. Among layered landscapes, I remember my bioregion and watershed, listening to the contours of wind and trees and birds co-mingling in the surrounding ravine. And I realize that this too is about self and other, community and place, a sense of place and the possibility of indwelling. 
spaces that welcome our bodies as they are, spaces that allow us to fully express ourselves, Spacey, spaces that enable our diverse full embodiment, spaces that welcome our collective and collaborative free movement in as through flourishing, unfettered and uninhabited, uninhibited exploration. Speaking of silence, there's the International Dark Sky Association, which is based in Tucson, Arizona, and it aims to raise awareness about the value of dark star-filled night skies and to encourage their protection and restoration. This includes mapping such places and decreasing light pollution, the importance of darkness. The One Square Inch Project in Olympia, Washington, where we lived previously, in, is in the Ho Rainforest in Olympia National Park. It's a preserved natural soundscape in the backcountry wilderness. It's one of the quietest known places in the US, and it also aims at preventing noise pollution, places of and for silence. And one of the reasons that the Square Inch project interests me is that there's an idea in Taoism called Fang Cun that means the square inch. Um, and this often refers to a subtle space in the heart that's empty and still, and that allows a deeper connection. So the possibility of listening to this dimension of ourselves, the silence within connecting with the silence without, or just sacred silence. I've already broken some taboos, speaking from a subjective or lived experience in terms of architecture. This is another taboo, invoking human potential and actualization, specifically this hierarchy of needs developed by Abraham Maslow, who lived from 1908 to 1970. And one of the reasons to present this is not to say it's definitive, but to ask us to inquire about these dimensions of ourselves and the human condition. The third force, that is, what is our potential and the possibility of actualization, our longing and fulfillment, inquiry, exploration, and reflection towards a new mindful modern. From the preface to Leaves of Grass, this is what you shall do. Love the earth and sun and the animals, despise riches, give alms to everyone that asks, stand up for the stupid and crazy, devote your income and labor to others, hate tyrants, argue not concerning God, have patience and indulgence toward the people, take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men, Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons, and with the young, and with the mothers of families. Read these leaves in the open air every season of every year of your life. Re-examine all you have been told at school or church or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul, and your very flesh shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency, not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face, and between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Louis. Very powerful presentation. Uh, I'll ask Andrew uh, to present next. Andrew? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Yeah, that was fantastic. I'm just gonna try and uh, make sure I can share this thing. I know we tested this, but. Does that look like it's working correctly? Yeah, looks Excellent. good. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Kurt. And I'd like to, and again, uh, as, 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 as Lewis has done, big uh, shout out, thank you to the Canadian Center for Mindful Habitats, uh, University of Manitoba, Algonquin College, College and to uh, Pallavi, uh, Kurt, and Roger. Um, Kurt and I go back a long way, uh, 25 years or so. He was a former student, and then uh, Roger and I have taught together. So, and it's nice to meet uh, Lewis and Pallavi through this through this process. Watching um, Lewis's presentation was absolutely fascinating, and I realized that even though 
there was a degree of cer certain, I don't want to say skepticism, but there was a degree of sort of um, uh, a doubt about my, my appropriateness for this discussion. Uh, and then through our conversations, I realized this is absolutely appropriate in many ways, uh, at least for me as a, as a novice when it comes to looking at architectural work in a certain way. But, he, but watching Lewis's presentation, there's so many overlaps from uh, the notion of provocation uh, to obviously the spiritualism of, of uh, Rothko and, and how that drives the, the, that beautiful work. I was thinking of starting my presentation with Rothko and the Marina Abramovich, the empathy actually fantastically of uh, Marina Abramovich. And then of course you can't, any architect can't, uh, can't deny the influence of the matrix as a kind of metaphor for almost everything, or certainly the, uh, the almost the, the the sort of hidden megalomaniacal uh, power or or tendencies of architecture to some degree. What I'd really like to talk about, though, and I think it, it makes sense, um, is some of Kurt's words at the beginning, where he really started talking about. Uh, marginalized, uh, how silence can converge with the notion of the marginalized. And uh, uh, I'd also like to uh, shout out to, to Lewis discussing um, Assisi and, 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 and those spaces. We will be touching a little bit on in this presentation on, on the notion of the cell, the notion of, uh, uh, of monastic spaces, just as a sort of metaphor for, for a way of making a contemporary space in some way. But um, the Assisi experience, and I managed to experience Assisi with very few people, just because it happened to occur at a, at a tremendous rainstorm and then was followed through uh, both the upper and lower churches through um, uh, by a crowd of, of, of uh, surging pilgrims that we were chased through. Um, so uh, there's so many overlaps and I think is really interesting. What I've tried to do today is actually create a kind of um, understanding about what we're trying to do within LeMay fieldwork, uh, specifically the fieldwork re applied research um, agenda. And, and through the conversations around silence and applied silence or silence as a, as a kind of design tool, it's a way of creating a contemporary architectural language. So there's uh, five components to this, a really short introduction on what fieldwork is and how we're trying to use applied research in some way. And, and also outline maybe the fact that this conversation has sort of changed that research agenda. Then the notion of contemplation and public memory, and that's looking at a specific project that we've been working on. It's about to go into construction, a very major project for us, for LeMay and fieldwork. Um, Another project, Silence and Sound, which is a, a project for the Catholic Church here in, in, uh, in Montreal. But again, uh, ecumenical and to some degrees, certainly uh, urban design, uh, certainly secular in the sense that it's more of an urban design project and an experience of the city project. We'll talk about it. Visual silence, uh, touching on, uh, I was fascinated that Lewis brought about the, the questions of autism, autism through, uh, uh, through the filter of, of um, animal cog cognition. And we have a series of, of projects that are really about uh, the cognitive process and how, how architecture uh, can respond through the application of silence, that silence, maybe not necessarily oral silence, but uh, could be visual silence, a notion of of the sensory spectrum. And then navigating silence, just a very, very quick study about a new piece of research we're doing where we're really researching the notions of monastic space around a new, a new project that I can't say so much about other than the fact that it's being driven by, by, the, by the fourth one. Also, I'll start with, with field work. Field work is really what is our applied research development tool. It's supported by LeMay, but it's also fundamentally a series of collaborations across different, different worlds. It is really a, um, uh, I, I, this is an interesting image. It's actually the, 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 we made our own office for our Toronto studio and we made, we bent plywood forms ourselves, but really this sort of layering of intensity and intent. It converges uh, some of our project, client project projects with uh, institutional, um, uh, if not clients, partners working with things like the Lamar Foundation in, in, in Montreal, which is a, a foundation dedicated to um, supporting uh, adults with autism. Uh, we have a series of other university uh, and research uh, groups that, that are involved in different degrees of, of research for us. And we're really working a little bit outside normative architecture, uh, and we're really working in projects as laboratories. They're either very much at the front uh, 
of, of the design of the normative design process. So working with partners who don't know what a project's potential are or could be, or working very far behind and looking at research and fun, uh, fundamentally trying to understand how that research can be applied in a broader sense on a new, on new, on new work. <clears throat> design as activism is really what we framed <clears throat> the work as about, about 18 months ago when we started thinking about this recalibration of something called field work. Um, and really trying to deal in a broad way with societal shifts. And it's becoming much more applied as we develop a kind of notion that our research is functioning as a kind of component of agency. So we're really, we're really intersecting that place between research and practice, and then the various partners that exist within that. We have five research, research buckets right now. And again, uh, uh, these are changing right now. They're, they're actually changing in response to a series of projects we've done in the last eight, nine months. And one of which is actually the preparation for this, this discussion. The idea of the commons is the idea of the common wheel, the common space, that notion that, that society and ecologies need to converge in some way. Circular systems, there's lots of information around all these five things. I'm just going to move through them very quickly. Circular systems is really about finance, government, and policy to some degree. Digitality, uh, and, uh, and I prefer to call it post digitality, this notion about where the virtual and technology and tech, the virtual. Uh, world and technology understands. We've got some applied research around lidar scanning and how to how to how to create a kind of convergence of real and digital space. Um, and then urban metamorphosis. And most of our projects right now are in this realm. We're working with the city of Calgary and the University of Calgary uh, on on a project. We're working in Beirut with one of our collaborators in field work. Um, we're working, of course, in Montreal on some large urban spaces uh, and trying to understand how fundamentally we can respond to various degrees of crisis within the urban context, but to, um, to Kurt's point about the marginalized, many of the projects and the ones, I'll, a couple of the ones that I'll talk about uh, over the next uh, few minutes are really about where uh, a, mar a marginalized community or a composition of marginalized communities land or find a place within the city. And really where silence lands, we have a kind of, um, we have a kind of uh, open bucket. It's sort of the, the wild card of we, which we call new apertures. And it's where we say, okay, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting tangent that's emerging out of this particular conversation. And this is certainly, uh, I guess, in terms of looking at the work in a certain way, this is where silence, uh, contemplative space, how we can connect a stream of research around the notion of silence is landing. It's really becoming now, I think, and will uh, in, in the beginning of 2022, a kind of thread that we're going to try and knit together around the work. Fieldwork is essentially open. There are new. There is a series of new collaborations, and uh, and uh, we've been speaking with both the University of Calgary on another collaboration over the last the last the last uh, few weeks. And uh, the University of British Columbia School of Architecture, various other components, and 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 and, and the openness is really the, the the thread that sort of keeps it interesting. One of the one of the most interesting things, and I'm I'm just going to start speaking about whether it's spiritual, religious, ecumenical, or secular spaces that have a kind of quality. I'm going to start touching on projects that that sort of lead to that. So. This was a project that a, a client came to us. They have a, a very important historical artifact within Toronto, and they really needed to understand, they really wanted to open up a conversation around what a space that is historically, obviously a spiritual or religious space. This is a church at 38 Walmer Road and how that architecture could be transformed in a way where its importance to the community could be maintained but the design solution and, and the way in which that artifact, that corpus, that, that body of building could be used uh, was uh, could be cracked open in terms of the heritage to Toronto and in terms of the community, how we could actually talk about that. So we were asked the question of, we don't know what to do with this and we'd like you to uh, create a series of questions for us. So it was a really interesting project for field work. But I'm gonna jump into a, now a particular series of projects and this is the one uh, which is really about this um, notion of a kind of recalibration of our voices this is marginalized spaces this is a project called place de montrealais in montreal it was an international design competition about two and a half years ago which we essentially went about we actually decided to create a 
a collaboration between ourselves, uh, a conceptual artist, uh, uh, and ourselves being a, our transdisciplinary team. So myself in, within within a, a sort of an overarching design, our landscape team led by Patricia Lucier, and then we brought a partner in, and a partner who I've worked with over thirty years, a conceptual artist uh, named Angela Silver. So this is very much a kind of um, a, a project that was the city of Montreal trying to recalibrate its its world, its, its understanding uh, of the city around redefining uh, the place of, of, of the history of women within the city. So uh, recalibrating Montreal's preoccupation to some degree with the, with the English language, French language, or English French cultural schism, and really saying there are a series of other stories within the world of Montreal that need to be recalibrated. So essentially from a Experiential point of view, it's about redefining the city through the lens of, of a marginalized population, one that has historically been silenced. That marginalized population is actually a composition of many populations. So it's really about indigenous groups. It's about uh, women of color. It's about uh, the history of the slave uh, the, of the slaves of Canada. It's about the history of the nuns who were the women builders. Uh, but it's about um, uh, really making that 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 recalibration deep and nuanced and that's why we decided to work with Angela on this this is one of Angela's projects it's a red thread book is taking a moribund artifact something that has very little value and through the application of what is archetypally called women's work which is sewing every line of this of this of this document with a, a series of red threads the, the project is the red thread book actually adding a kind of on a kind of infinitely, infinitely poetically meaningful value to something that is, has very little meaning, and then actually then presenting it as a kind of new narrative. So the language gets uh, Angela works 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 almost solely within the idea of language. The language itself, the Italian language, gets denuded. The, the language of a marginalized or banal quality gets denuded. But the idea of women's work, of labor, the hours of labor necessary to change this artifact from a 150-page pulp fiction to a, a an art-based artifact is what's key. Her she continued to work within this notion of the banal, this notion of the of the silence of the voices through pro, just projecting uh, text forward. So so not so much projecting a voice as projecting an image of a voice, and what that means within these contexts. This is a project for the Dumbo Arts. Um, festival in, in, in Brooklyn, New York, a few years ago, where essentially a kind of more, uh, again, a, a banal signboard is used to create and to project Angela's poetic language across that, that world. And then taking artifacts, so the artifacts of translation, artifacts of, of how we actually tell these stories, how we actually make text, textual stories. Uh, this is essentially typewriter ribbons. If those of you who are a certain age know what a typewriter ribbon is, and then recalibrating as a, as a sort of, uh, actually to Lewis's matrix reference, a kind of meaningless from a textual point of view uh, document that then creates again much meaning through the recalibration of it as a as a as a visual artifact somewhat akin to maybe a Rothko maybe a at least a, a sort of degree of abstraction that demands you to be pulled into uh, into the image in a very very deep way. The Place de Montreal is taking these ideas, our architectural ideas that were that were are our transdisciplinary ideas around architecture and landscape and city building and urban metamorphosis, and then converging Angela's work as a as a as a tool for the commemoration, the unsilencing of the of the women of, of Montreal or the women in the history, the women builders in the history of Montreal. We, the project is placed very much at the center of the city of Montreal. So to the uh, to the uh, uh, lower right of this image is actually the city hall of Montreal. Uh, there's a very famous plaza called Champ de Mars. Uh, below that, the green plaza. And then in the red circle, uh, sorry, in the red framework is the site for the Place de Montreal -Aise. It skirts across the Ville Marie Expressway. It essentially functions as a linking device across a street from what is now a major hospital site, the Shum Hospital project of mine from a few years ago. So it's at the center of the city. It, it is taking this sort of um, uh, unsilencing, this notion that we can recalibrate our histories through that. 
the the redefinition of this work or the idea of this work is really we see it as there's a series of elements and two of them are really I'm going to focus on because they really are about creating contemplative space a, a notion of, of 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 a of a contemplative space that emerges out of the project but that also uh, hopefully enhances the experience of the individual so the components of the project uh, can you get, can you see my cursor as I move it around the screen as uh, can somebody just let me know if that's the case. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can see it. So this is the uh, City Hall of Montreal. This is the Champ de Mars. This is our project, which is essentially seen as a forest of memory, which uh, we're implanted as a kind of limit, as a filter to the large city. There's an existing metro station. And then this is what we're calling the Pre Fleury, or, or, or which means meadow. And essentially, it's not so much a public park as it is a moment in which one can find a sort of contemplative position over at different points in the city over time. And then there's a series of commemorative devices that exist that allow also a, a, a hopefully a series of contemplative moments. So there's the idea of the metro station and a very important um, uh, art piece by Marcel Ferrand that exists within the space. And essentially, that's a restoration. So it's about the found object here. Uh, this is a, uh, and we'll talk a lot about this component of the project. It's a, it's a, it's a little uh, 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 transformer building. It's a, a little necessary um, building that's because the, the, the project exists above the metro station and the highway. It's a very complex site technically. So we transform that object. And it's a really important convergence of architecture, urban, urban gesture, and, and Angela's artwork. And we'll talk a bit about that. And then there's so there's the found object, the transformed object, and then there's the new object, which is essentially the gradins. So as you move across the site and you move across the, the, the street, you're on the bridge that gets you to City Hall. You also need to navigate the ramp or you can navigate the ramp that then is engaged by a gradin or, or, a, or a series of step stairs that you can sit on and then find moments. And then within that is the text, the text of the project. The text of the project is where Angela really says that you actually find yourself embedded in these moments of silence through the engagement of certain language. And this is a very famous wall in, the, uh, in, in Rome where uh, you understand the history of the city. It's a narrative of the history of the city. Um, that notion, uh, we can talk about it in great detail, but fundamentally it's that notion of the haptic engagement of those sort of moments. The fact that you can touch them, you can feel them, you can find yourself in them to some degree. And Angela's work is really about taking that textural component and then shifting in scale, shifting in different language processes, shifting different degrees of fragmented meaning so that those fragments of meaning you can find yourself in and then recalibrating them at different scales. So this is a study of the, of the text components. These are the names of some of the 21 women that are being commemorated at Place de Montréalais testing the scale, seeing how the body responds to those scales within our fieldwork workshop in Montreal. And this was fundamentally the 21 women that are being commemorated. So this is this notion of, of, of how we can commemorate. The Place de Montreal A's does it in a way that it's not episodic. It's not just a shrine to a series of women. It's embedding the names of these women and fragments of the names of these women across the site. So you not only understand that you're speaking about Marie-Joseph Angelique or, um, or, or any number of, of the 21, but you're also talking about fragments of their names which allow you access to your own identity, allow you access to your own place and bring, brings it into yourselves. And this, this language pattern, this strategy of sort of delaminating de uh, the specific names into a more general understanding of of engagement then gets applied to the, the architectural object, which is this round shroud that I, that I explained. It's the, just the artifact that's transformed. So this becomes, um, in our world, uh, really the convergence between the architectural work and Angela's work, a four meter high by 22 meter in diameter uh, stainless steel shroud that's installed on the site. It has a certain presence uh, up into and outside of the city, but mostly what it does fundamentally is it creates this moment of silence where you can engage this mirrored form. You can essentially move yourself towards this, this object and find yourself completely immersed in both an image of yourself as an individual, but then in the background and around the context, an image of the city, and then embedded and carved into that 
the idea of the names themselves. So this is one of these moments of contemplation, these moments of a kind of perceived silence that occur when you're, consu when you're absolutely um, uh, em embedded in, and you've got the forest of memory in the background that I discussed, but you're embedded in this cacophony of the city. And this, uh, this, this, this object has been tested. This is Angela taking photographs of our, of essentially a six foot by four foot test of this a three quarter inch stainless steel polished ply with the perforations of the letters. So you can see through those perforations. And then you have the reflection of the, yourself and the reflection of your context. So this is one moment that we feel is whether it's silence or whether it's certainly contemplative, it's a notion of finding yourself in a very large uh, urban condition. And then that, that amplified notion of individual silence is absolutely key. The second component, and there are many components to this project, I'm trying to sort of define these, these, these moments of contemplative space, is actually the play, play flirty itself. It's the meadow itself. So again, you find yourself moving across the site, across the bridge, you find yourself moving up a ramp, but it, there is what conceptually we'd find as 400 perforations in what is a solid planar, planar piece of architecture that moves across across this street as, as a bridge. And those perforations are filled with flowering devices. And we've got lots of work on this. And this was the collaboration between Angela and our landscape architect, Patricia Lucier. So we found 21 species of, of, of flowering plants. Those 21 species of flowering plants, the challenge is to move them across Montreal and say how much of this can occur and how can we calibrate and curate uh, the planting and the flowering and the, the sort of resurgence of flowering strategies. Uh, and create a place in which, at least for parts of the year, at least at moments when these when these plants are fully flowered and they're six feet high, and these the you know these 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 perforations, these these round circles of planting, can create these moments of contemplation, these moments of silence, where if you choose to, you can find yourself in a city, a dense intensified city and find these moments of silence as moments of contemplation. And that was really done through a fairly complex understanding of, of the flowering strategies of these 21 plants. And this is just a sequence of images around how that landscape both create moves from a, a, a kind of round hole in the ground with very few sort of um, with very little density, very little depth to something that around the middle of August uh, to the middle of September, you'll be surrounded with planted objects with different colors that actually then you're fully immersed in. So you find yourselves on these intricate pathways between these planting devices and it becomes as much as you want as the user, a contemplative space, a space where you find silence with the, within the cacophony of the city. And if you choose, uh, you can ponder the, the recalibration of the history through many, many lenses. It's, it's really, um, Angela calls it really our duty to remember, our duty to sort of create a, an acknowledgement of, uh, of uh, a reframing of our, of our, of our relationships. And, and to whatever de depth or degree one feels necessary, it, 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 is, it is one that changes as the planting and as the seasons change. And of course, Montreal is a winter city, as we know now, there's four inches of snow on the ground this morning, and it becomes a different place. But fundamentally, this notion of a contemplative space, this notion of being able to look at the plants and haptically understand them and see them and feel them, and then to understand that this space has a certain scale that responds to the city, but then also be aware that you're immersed in the city is important. The second project I want to talk about is fundamentally framed around silence or, or the sort of tensions between silence and the idea of sound, instrument, music. It's called 61 Bells. It's fundamentally a, a recalibration of the ascension process at the Oratoire Saint-Joseph in Montreal, which is a very important Catholic monument. It's one of the most important monuments in the city. Just architecturally, its presence is tremendous, and it's on a very, very important site. But the ascension sequence at the Oratoire Saint-Joseph is one considered of pilgrimage or at least of visitation, and it demanded a certain uh, movement up the hill, up a hill, to the Oratoire itself, whether through steps or in some cases people moving up the steps on their knees. But it was an, an ill-defined or at least a, a, a not clearly understood uh, um, uh, sequence for any number of people, whether you're marginalized through physical uh, a physical uh, uh, um, 
mechanisms, whether you 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 need to you you you're not necessarily interested in the in the in the, in the experience of the pilgrim, but want to experience the city in a certain way. Essentially, what we our strategy was to create a sound device, a device that the the second uh, the second component of the project was the rehousing of the sixty one bells. These were bells that were designed for. Uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris that were brought to Canada and the Artoire when it was when it was built and they're housed now in a very sort of small scale object. So to house those, create a a, a, a Carillion, a, a bell tower in that in that very traditional architectural sense that there exists a bell tower and a and a chapel, but create a contemporary bell tower. So you move in from what is essentially a large parking lot. It's the city. You move into this bell tower and you find yourself in a series of ascension devices that are actually a, a new silence, a new way of actually dealing with, with the, 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 the ascension sequence to the building, to the primary historical building, but then create a sound device. So, um, so this notion of silence becomes, uh, I'm just gonna try and reduce this, uh, okay. The silent intervention is seen in, in many ways as, 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 as fundamental. So it's silence in the sense that it's embedded in the landscape and the, the, the Gabion wall that you see here is actually made from the rocks that are, that are taken out of the site. The site is actually, um, the site is actually uh, excavated to create the space for this. The, the context is very, very important. It's a, a over Mount, Mount Royal from the downtown of Montreal. But the uh, the oratoire itself, as it exists, has a kind of interesting cross-sectional relationship with the city. And the sound that's created or the sound that you experience with the oratoire is a sort of humming noise from the city itself as it moves across the mountain. But then really the oratoire itself sort of views to the west, uh, to the uh, slightly to the north, to the northwest. And it really is about the sort of expanses of Montreal to some degree. Uh, our work was really about looking at that. So a silent intervention, 61 bells, 61 frames of the existing condition. And, and the, the first component we did was actually take a sound uh, sound uh, piece, create a sound piece of sound art that was really about the bells themselves and, and their rhythmic uh, uh, intervention into what is essentially a quiet site. And then really then talking about this notion of, of ascension. So the existing oratoire, these are my sketches that are placed over and trying to create a first plan-based ascension notion that you find a direct route through a crevasse into the mountain. You find a, a series of ascension moments and then you find a series of viewplanes. So you always understand your relationship with the oratoire as an architectural element of the dome of the oratoire as an architectural element. But you also always understand that you're embedded in a, in a, in a landscape, in a topography, you're in this crevasse. So this notion of, of, of moving into this crack, understanding that there's a bell tower above and that, and that that's always there and that, and that, and that periodically, cyclically, that creates a, a sort of a, a sound element, that the architecture is an instrument for that sound. And that fundamentally there's a series, there's that relationship with the direct vertical uh, architectural object and then the slow ascension up to the oratoire building itself. So this is this notion of the site as a receptacle, the idea that there's a, uh, the site itself. There's the idea of the music of the of the of, of the um, of the uh, the organist and the and the bells. There's actually a musician within the object within the bell tower itself. There's a space for the organist who makes the music. The idea that then this becomes an instrument. So the interior strategies of the project are the creation of a wooden. Uh, and you'll see in the renderings a wooden a wooden uh, sort of device that that pulls both metaphorically but also in a realistic way the sound, and then it makes this sort of instrument uh, fully complete. So the architecture is functioning as a as a as a pragmatic to some degree infrastructural ascension. It's functioning as a poetic experience of understanding ascension as a as a religious experience, as a spiritual experience, but then it's also functioning as a as a as a as a as a musical instrument. These are the study models of that idea of the musical instrument and how that could function. And then this is the cross section of the site. So as you move through the Gabion wall, through the landscape, 
into the ascension moment, you understand because of the foreshadowing that you're below the bell towers, and then you move into this series of ascension moments. And these are these are sequenced pretty carefully, the short sections, which I won't spend too much time, but these notions of entering the building, understanding the bell tower exists, and to some degree understanding that the, the existing building, the very historical building is there. It's a very linear process at this point, a sequence of escalators, elevators, and stairs. Moving into that and looking up at the device. So this is looking up at the bells straight up into the sky and understanding that this wood device starts with the bells and the organist. And that wood device really becomes the element that pulls you up into space. And then as you're moving up into that space, a series of skylights, a series of reveals that show your progress towards the device of the oratoire itself, the, the element of the oratoire itself. And then a series of public spaces where you can uh, move out the public spaces that have a degree of control, again, a, a degree of, of silence as you move back and, and have potential views to the city. So this notion of a, of a project that uses the, the, the tension between silence and sound, between a curated sound, a sort of musical sound, and actually allowing that tension to be the fundamental driver for the project is what's pushing this project forward. This project is under construction right now. I, I'm cycling almost every week. I, I hit the site for whatever reason, and it's the crevasse exists, and it's a very going to be a very, very dramatic moment in the landscape. I'm going to talk very quickly about this. This touches on Lewis's comments around autism. And we were asked by the Lamar Foundation within, um, within Montreal to look at a very pragmatic problem of how adults with autism actually uh, exist within space. There's a, a funding uh, gap where young people with autism have lots of funding. They understand, uh, no, they don't specifically, but there's programs that have lots of funding. But as soon as you move into adulthood, uh, there's a lack of, of uh, architectural or, or physical space, housing space and, 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 and physical amenities. What we decided to deal with was actually look at through field work, look at this through a multi-sensory approach. So suggesting that our work with autism, or at least the research that we did with aut on, on, on autistic experience, were fundamentally about uh, the sensory spectrum. And that we were designing essentially to create not an oral silence, to some degree there is an oral silence, but actually either a, a sensory silence, a visual silence, a visual curation. And, and through the sort of looking at the research, whether it's vision, hearing, haptic experience, sense of air, the, the notion of the skin, these, these, these really intensified um, sensory perceptions that we could recalibrate an architectural space around these. So, and, and criterion three, minimizing sensory overload, is really uh, of the goals that were identified through the, the um, literary research, one that really became the one that was most appropriately addressed within our architecture. So this notion of acoustics, spatial sequencing, and the idea of escape space became the three key design, design elements. And then compartmentalization, transitional zones, sensory zoning, and safety. What we really tried to do was create five design drivers, the idea of sequence, threshold, aperture, flux, and identity as a way of creating an architectural language, an applied design language that would respond to these elements. We looked at some basic programmatic, so what, what are the uses within the building and, and within a potential building? Uh, how does it differ from a normative housing complex? We analyzed that very quickly through these notions of fragments, spatial sensory fragments, rather than looking at it through there needs to be a bedroom, a kitchen, a uh, whatever, we actually said, there's there, if we push this project completely through this notion of a, of, of, of a sensitivity to the sensory, uh, sensory matrix, then we'll end up with a new architectural language, a new contemporary modern for that, for, for the use of that word, allocation of an architectural energy, architectural investment, and that will be more appropriate. So this notion of the sensory spectrum from low stimulus to high stimulus became a diagram to understand how the how the project would be framed from a program point of view and that, and that within that there's low stimulus spaces transitional spaces and high stimulus spaces and how could we control that notion of stimulus this became a pretty pragmatic matrix of understanding that but what it became very quickly was understanding fragments so we have a series of of, of design filters the idea of how the idea of fragment one which was houses how we can talk about sequence within the notion of the of the home or the house 
how we can talk about threshold. And again, taking the idea of threshold and instead of making it a door frame within a door frame, a door within that, a window within the door frame, how, how can we completely minimize that condition and create a silence of experience, a, 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 a reduced uh, stimuli of experience while people move from the public to the private within 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 the idea of home. So threshold, aperture, the notion of the window, how can we create a kind of response to something as normative as the hole in the wall that creates a view? How can we detail that so that the visual stimuli, how can we uh, you know, take it from ceiling to floor or across the, the length of a room? Flux, how can we actually talk about design of bedrooms so that they can be changeable and adaptable, a bit more pragmatic? And then the notion of identity. So how can we, rather than creating a cacophony of visual imagery, create a singular or at least uh, two images, two, two com design components or three design components that create this identity while reducing the amount of um, uh, stimuli, but also creating a kind of poetic understanding and a, and, a, and, a, and a spatial, something with spatial depth and nuance. We did the same thing with the idea of the common spaces. So the idea of sequence, the idea of threshold, the idea of aperture, and the idea of flux change future. And then that notion of identity within the common spaces, again, with a minimal material strategy. And then we did the same thing with the transition spaces. I'll go through these fairly quickly. I can spend more time if somebody wants to. The idea of sequence, threshold, aperture, and change flux, and then identity. So essentially we're creating a, a language, a contemporary modern language, that which, which upends the idea of, 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 of residential uh, of a residential project through the visual stimuli, the idea of silencing architecture to the point where it's appropriate for the autistic experience. The exterior spaces were the same, sequence, threshold, aperture, flux, and identity. What we did with that work very quickly is we created a, an architectural proposition. What we said was if we had a site and, and the client did have a site, but we couldn't really speak about it too much. It was still, a, it was still at that point in, under discussion. What if we were to apply this to a full and complete architectural project, a modern architectural project that helped uh, propose a solution to this experience? And we came up with what we feel is a really resonant uh, architectural response. So this notion of the sequence of the sex sensory spectrum became a programmatic device. The idea of the sequence spatial cognition became a series of spatial relationships, three-dimensional relationships that which we evolved. The idea that you looped through this sequence, the idea that it was a continual experience that could be repeated, but was still minimal in a way, it had three dimensional space and these floor plans show that it wasn't linear. It created a series of rooms within rooms. It created rooms within a hallway condition. It created uh, essentially a, a, a fairly radical, a fairly provocative understanding of spatial sequence from a normative point of view, but became something that was very, very um, interesting from our point of view, pushing the architecture. So this is an architecture that's not interested in formal strategies in any real way. It's not interested in the pro forma of a housing project. What it is interested in is creating a, an architectural solution that, that, that actually responds to the autistic experience. And it does that by then uh, creating a floor plan, creating a program, but fundamentally by limiting the amount of material, limiting the amount of spatial and material stimuli. And the project really became very much about um, creating minimal frames or pro projecting forward minimal frames, minimal detailing, minimal sort of experiential uh, stimuli, very, very uh, interestingly through the notion of three materials. So what we decided was uh, there's spatial, there's the armature, there's the masses, there's the, the felt planes and the cork planes. So we have three materials, one neutral material, which is essentially drywall concrete, uh, drywall and concrete, which is essentially the architectural armature, and then every other material in the project becomes either a, a light gray felt or cork plane. So this notion of sound stimuli, the notion of silence, the notion of a building being able to uh, expand and, and completely uh, absorb silence became absolutely key. This is prod this is work that's very much under under development right now, and it's uh, we're continuing to, do, to evolve this project for this client, but we think it's really important research. And then very quickly at the end, this notion of navigating silence. We've got a very, very new project where we're looking at monastic space. It's based 
heavily on the research strategies that were put that we put in place for the uh, for the autistic work. The idea of monastic space. There's a series of historical precedents through our research. Uh, this is the uh, this is a monastery. It's the Gallery of Silence at the Loreo Monastery. There's a, a new intervention that really is about sort of the relationship between a courtyard and, and in this case the gallery is this gallery of silence the the cloister the church and then of course this the individual cells themselves from a modernist point of view um uh, le corbusier's uh, la tourette is a very key reference for us this notion that architecture can respond in many, many ways, and, and a modernist or an overtly high modernist architecture can respond to this notion of, of, of the need for silence within space, this notion of the cell, this notion of monastic space, and the uh, contemporary notions of architectural, you know, creating certain rhythms within a section, creating certain experiences within a, within a landscape plan are absolutely driving our research. And then on a much more contemporary note, uh, Neil Denare is, uh, Neil Denare is a, a speculative architect. This work was, is almost now 20, 30 years old, but it was an urban monastery that Denare had defined as a speculative project around a new way of living within an urban environment. Again, all these projects taking the notion of silence and allowing a contemporary architectural language to help define that. So in this case, the cells themselves became much larger rooms that became a very strong um, uh, formal strategy around, uh, around an organization of the monastery itself. There's so much work within the history of the monastery, certainly the Western monastery that informs the way in which we perceive our cities now. Which is, which is important, but of course, then it demands the question about the broader understanding of ecclesiastical or spiritual architecture and how, it can, how all other models can continue and form our work. Our research was really based around functional. There's monastic functions that are occurring within a local monastery. And then this notion about understanding without moving into the spiritual documentation, the, the, the clear aspects of monastic life that could inform an architectural construct, order, hierarchy, work, community, and solitude. And this notion that, that, that these components could become, like with the autism work, an alternate program, an alternate way of defining a, a potentially residential project. And then fundamentally, the relationship with nature and the relationship with time. The fact that time, uh, nature, is a fundamental link all the time within uh, within monastic life, or at least monastic life um, in the examples that we have in Quebec. And the relationship with time is completely uh, completely defined differently than, than in most ca cases. And I'll go through this work quickly. These are essentially using the methodology from the autism project and saying, okay, what are the design drivers for this, again, very early research on monastic life, the idea of intimacy, order, aperture, and interaction. Those fragments are the cells, the commons, the commons, the common spaces, the withdrawal spaces, and the exterior spaces. So we've started to develop a language and understanding about how these these spaces could start to be defined, how they relate to light in some cases, how they relate to each other. Certainly, again, this notion of aperture, how within the cell, how the filtering of light, uh, the relationship with light, the relationship with views can become a, a distinct language. And then the interaction within the within the the program themselves. So this is taking literally a vow of silence, an architecture that's defined around a vow of silence, taking the qualities that have emerged from that, and to Lewis's point, creating a a secular monastery, the Merton book, uh, uh, the, uh, the the other documents, the. Um, the new silence uh, book were 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 what were taking those references, references like those, and suggesting that there's a new contemporary language, notion of intimacy within the commons, notion of order, an understanding of uh, of 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 where you exist or where the cell exists within a within a broader order, and the notion of aperture again within the common spaces. So a broader view links to landscape and and the commons really being the link between the cloister this, and the cells themselves. So this notion of withdrawal, being able to move away from the cloister through the corridor to the cells and the notion of aperture within those cells. Again, this is very preliminary work, uh, but it's one where, where, where we're using it as an armature to move forward. And uh, again, moving through the exterior spaces and how they exist. And very quickly, that's allowed us to develop a series of broader ty typologies, 
that we're trying to understand a place for this for this architecture, how a broader architecture can start to exist and what the qualities of these would be, whether it's a it's a historical reference, whether it's a, a notion of a kind of contemporary idea about a shroud, about different degrees of silence or whether it's about notions of a village. That's very preliminary research on one of our new projects, but, uh, and that's, uh, oh, and the cell typologies themselves, the relationship between the space itself and how we can create various spatial conditions within the cells. Uh, other than these quick physical models, uh, looking at our digital technology, printing these, that's the end of my presentation. I hope that was okay. That was wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. I think I could listen to you all day. Um, I, I know we. I, I, I wish uh, you should. You, uh, Kurt, you should talk to my wife then. That's, a, that's definitely not the case around here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> maybe in the question period. Um, so maybe w what we can do. I, I, I think both presentations are amazing and touch upon you know aspects of silence in in different ways. And I want to uh, get to you know some of the dialogue going back and forth. But maybe just to give Andrew a break, I might ask Lewis um, to begin our discussion with just your reflection and um, your uh, understanding of Andrew's work. And then I'll ask Andrew to reflect on um, Lewis's work as well. But Lewis, would you want to begin and maybe just talk you know for uh, a few seconds about what you saw in Andrew's work in relationship to our session uh, discussion? Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that immediately comes up for those of us that are interested in this question is how is what we're doing contemplative? So not just in the design of it, but in the participation of it, the presentation of it. So I think from a contemplative studies perspective, one of the kinds of key questions in this inquiry is are we bringing a contemplative approach and a contemplative presence to whatever activity we're doing? So that's one thing that comes to mind is having that be a kind of primary framework that we're using the question of the contemplative being at the forefront of whatever it is. Um, but I think more specifically what I found interesting and I think not just interesting but profound and important is creating contemplative space in urban environments. So in terms of what I was talking about with the importance of contemplative silence is it possible to give people a break from the kind of onslaught of urban identity and being with these intentional contemplative spaces where maybe that silence is present in a relatively noisy soundscape? Um, another thing that came to mind was um, this as a kind of sanctuary, right, within another kind of environment and opportunities to enter that contemplative space. I think on a more critical level, not about Andrew, but about some of these questions about the relationship between silence and sound is I've spent a lot of my life in Boston and San Diego, and I think a lot about Catholic church bells. Um, one part of me appreciates Catholic church bells, um, the sound, the resonance, the quality, but as a non-Catholic, it also feels like a colonization of space, a reminder of who controls the space of who settled the space in the case of San Diego, of who's colonized the space, um, and what are the like vo voices that have been silenced in that space. Um, so I think that's something else to consider is that not everyone is going to experience that soundscape in the same way um, or receive it as the same influence. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, very good, thank you, Lewis. Uh, Andrew, would you be able to just give some comments on your reflection on Lewis's talk? Sure, sure. But Kurt, if you're running the show, I think I'd like to maybe return to that notion of colonization because it, it actually really is, it's it's within the implicit tensions between two of our projects, Place de Montreal is, and, and the Oratoire Saint Joseph. It's a fantastic conversation given that I spent a year in Rome and I spent all that time listening to Bell every quarter of the hour and, and understood it in one way and in the other way as a non-Catholic, as a non-religious person. So I, I think uh, I would be a great conversation around, around that and I'd love to talk about that. But I think one thing about Lewis's presentation, I always love speaking with people who are smarter than me because at the end of the day, you, you learn a certain amount. And I learned that and we've done this, we've done this at other times. We've used film and presentations sometimes where you have an immersive experience, but it seems to me, I my talk was really about, here's three projects. Sure, there might be interesting, sure it's about research, sure there's there's questions there, but it's didactic to a certain degree. And it's Lewis's presentation for me was this, this notion about, 
spending, I'm not quite sure how many minutes it was, maybe it was up to four minutes in, uh, you know, um, Marina Abramovich's empathy was really, really uh, fascinating to be able to take the time within a kind of uh, exposition of ideas and say, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about something that you have to imagine. I'm talking about something that's on the screen, that it's that's here. And we do this <clears throat> when we actually presented our, our round because the, the Place de Montreal is was a competition in the, in the second round when you, when you, you became a, a one of five shortlisted people and then you had to do a major public presentation in Montreal. And Angela Silver knows Abramovich's work really well. She's, a, she's also a performance artist. And she decided, and we decided, we agreed with her that the first, we only had 15 minutes, 14 minutes to present. And we took the first four minutes of that presentation and just had the light on Angela and the names, that slide coming up with the names that it started to appear as letters. And Angela just read the names of these 21 women. It was completely upending the notion of the architectural competition presentation. It was pushing somebody into an immersive, contemplative space. So taking them in a context, which is incredibly didactic, incredibly expository in its spirit, and then pulling them into this space of emergent and contemplation within the project. And you have people at what is essentially a municipal architecture presentation, you have people in the audience crying. So to be able to do that and to be able to actually touch the, the sort of senses, uh, Lewis's presentation was fantastic in that way. The, uh, I, it was a Rothko that the music was moving into, right? Am I right, Lewis? That Rothko? No, no. no? Okay. Yeah, it was just another abstract painter. It, it felt like a Rothko. I mean, and I, again, as somebody who's non-religious, I understand what Rothko's spirituality brought to his work. And it's, you know, you, you have to appreciate it. So I guess there's this sort of connection between ideas and, and theater and the theater of the presentation, which I loved about Lewis's presentation. And then again, something that I try to do, and sometimes we fail because we want to get so much across is this notion of touching so many things, understanding that you can talk about the sensory perception of your dog and then, and then be talking about, uh, you know, spiritual leaders from the 15th century or the 17th century. And then you can move to contemporary art at the same time. I actually learned like, I mean, I'm getting, older I, I i you know i think i know a lot but i loved lewis's presentation i actually learned so much about the breadth of this and it will frame i hope a further collaboration on what we're trying to do i think this notion about what what sometimes when people try to speak about architecture sometimes and they're not architects or they're not academics in architecture it loses it there's a there's a kind of a naivete and there was no naivete in this in this presentation. It was something where we can easily make links to the way we, we make architecture. So, I mean, I know that my role is not to say, oh, Lewis, that was great. Oh, Andrew, that was great. It's like, but it was a fascinating and, and, and really powerful journey. And the fact that it was a sequential one. I used to be an actor and we used to talk about how you can move emotions up and down within the theatrical experience. It did that. I think <clears throat> this notion about um, cognitive understanding and in a much more applied way, uh, the links that we're trying to make between, you know, cognitive research around autism, around animals, around perception, and then what that means to space and then what that means to uh, an understanding of our spiritual <clears throat> world, or at least our contemplative world, I think is powerful too. <clears throat> I hope that's reasonable, but I, but I do want to talk about the hegemony of the Catholic Church in certain spaces within Western world and, and how we can respond to it. Okay. Well, I, I think if that's a topic that, you know, Lewis brought up and Andrew wants to talk about, then maybe we could talk about this idea of uh, the colonization of silence, colonization of space. So, uh, Lewis, do, would you want to maybe just elucidate a little bit more about what you were talking about? And then, Andrew, you can respond. Yeah, I mean, I think I would frame it slightly differently in this case to make it maybe more about what I mentioned at the beginning. I talk something that's visionary rather than critical. And I've mentioned this a number of times that one of the primary contemplative practices that I try to do is looking at dissatisfaction or looking at critique as having some kind of longing for something else and a vision for another possibility. And I think in this case, I would actually reframe it through the Rothko Chapel, which is not about the colonization of space in that sense. It was actually, when you look at the kind of history of the design, it was a collaboration with the local communities. So I don't know how many people have visited it, but from the outside, it looks like a very nondescript building. And you think, well, why? Why would you put these amazing paintings and 
when you experience the paintings, it is a kind of contemplative experience, maybe even a religious experience. Um, and talking to people there, depending on what their backgrounds are, they have all different types of experiences within that space. But the way I showed it to you was the kind of empty welcoming space, but they reconfigure the space in all kinds of ways, depending on the event. Um, and one of the reasons to bring this up is I think it's an example of the way in which silence and emptiness, um, that kind of contemplative spatiality can welcome people in from all different backgrounds. So another really interesting part of that space is when you go into the entryway, um, the kind of lobby area, there are scriptures and texts from all different traditions that have been put there by the local communities with the idea that literally anyone could walk into that space and feel welcomed and participating and being able to use it in their own way contemplatively. So I would, I, I think, frame that as the juxtaposition to the occupation of space, which I think is one of the ongoing questions with also these questions of design and architecture is, are we creating space or are we occupying space? Um, and what's the difference? What's the quality of that? And I think this also relates to contemplative silence and listening. Um, my experience with people who do contemplative practice and especially silence-based contemplative practice is they have a larger space to listen to other perspectives. And this is clearly revolutionary and transformative in terms of especially the United States, I think our present moment of not listening to other people, not hearing other people, um, not creating a space where there could be mutual understanding and participation. Yeah, physical and actual, you know, kind of intellectual space, right? You know, and then receptive space as well. Yeah. Andrew, your, your take on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on the Catholic thing again, uh, uh, just quickly, but I think there's lots that Lewis just said that we can that we can riff on. This notion of, um, you know, I did live in Rome, and every 15 minutes you're certain you're hearing different versions of different bells. There's a sense of kind of organizing your life, which seems somehow, you know, it's sort of almost a reference to the fascist history of, of Italy, of Rome, more than, more than anything else. But there's also a kind of understanding, that, uh, I guess, um, you know, as somebody who does, who, who, who doesn't make those links to a kind of a sequence of, 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 uh, of myth-based kind of rituals, as somebody who kind of understands it more as a, of a construction of the city, I think it's, uh, I think, again, it's, it's a double-edged sword. What we're working to do, and again, I refer to Angela Silver, she's so important to our work at this point, and she's currently a PhD candidate at Queen's uh, University in, in, uh, in Cultural Studies, but the work is based around the, 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 her, the Place de Montreal's project and the decolonization and the notion that we have to look very much and aggressively, provocatively beyond the historical constructs of our city. Even the project itself sort of misaligns and reconfigures and recalibrates the notion of the colonial grid that so defines Montreal. It actually is not organic in the sense, it's actually aggressively fracturing that idea about how we understand the city. So from a formal sense, from a way in which we perceive the city generally, it tries to do that. But then that notion that is trying to fracture also the historical constructs of, of what has defined the, the political structure, the cultural structure of Montreal through not discussing language in any sense other than this inclusive way, this positive way of moving forward. And I love the fact that Lewis took that conversation, my, my commentary around the schisms that, that occur, the idea of the, the colonization and said we can move positively in public space. I think Place de Montreal is is fundamentally trying to do that. I also think we should learn more from pre-Christian, pre-structures. Pre I mean, I lived, again, I lived in Roma and one of the favorite things we did was we, we, had, we, we had the opportunity to, to, uh, to avoid the tourist, uh, the tourist crowds. And I can remember waking up early on a Saturday morning and it raining and talking to my son about what he wants to do. And he said, I wanna to go to the Pantheon. I wanna see the rain fall through the, 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 the oculus of the Pantheon. And we started, and I was studying the Pantheon, and I was understanding that it's, it precedes Christianity, it precedes the church, it's sure it was certainly a kind of monument to a, to a, it has no hierarchy really in the space other than the oculi, it has a fundamentally haptic moment that's at the heart of its construction where the sun comes through the oculi and it, it touches on particular words within the, within the, the frieze that's inside. And it, and it fundamentally re redefines the city. But strangely enough, to call that space democratic, like the Rothko Chapel that Lewis was talking about, 
it is non, it's not even ecumenical. It's like non-denominational and only by accident for a thousand years of its history did it get used as a, as, as a church within the Catholic, within the Catholic church. So this notion about accepting that our, that our, that, that our historical spaces, the paradigms, the typologies that sort of define our architectural history have to move beyond. It's, a, it's like, it's like acquiescing that the history of contemporary art owes much to the church and you can walk into churches in Rome and look at uh, Caravaggio's right and the Caravaggio's are full of secular ideas but that's where you find them moving beyond that very quickly and saying okay that exists but now let's 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 move forward let's look at Marina Abramovich or or or, or let's look at that thing and, and some I'm not making any sense at all um Anyway, the, <laughs> I've got all these notes here. This notion of our, we have a duty to remember. Angela talks about a duty to remember, but a duty to remember a completeness and to create those spaces of debate, to talk about the fact that Canada had slaves, to talk about the fact that we're, we're finding graves filled with, you know, finding fields filled with the graves of, of, of young children and, and accept, you know, we, I spoke about this in a, in a talk we gave around Canadian identity. We talked about the, um, you know the the uh, residential schools program and the 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 the, the, the discoveries we're now making and make that part of a kind of recalibration of our colonials, but also making it part of how we move forward. Louis, did you have any um, further comments on the topic of this colonization? No, I mean, I think it's just um, important, as I said, to consider the diversity of perspectives on these kinds of experiences or spaces, or even as I said, I mean, as counterintuitive as it may sound, that different people have different views and experiences of silence itself. Um, and so when we present these things or make certain kinds of assumptions about space and experience, there might be a whole group of people that are being marginalized or disempowered or disenfranchised in that conversation where we're, we were not attentive to their um, sensibilities. And I, I really appreciated that aspect of Andrew's presentation about the kind of sensory spectrum um, and what is it like. And this is partly why I put that Alvin Ailey um, dance theater company on there to kind of show, you know, what is it like to include different bodies in different spaces and um, watch the expression of that perspective. So I think this is one thing that's really important about this is, is allowing people and not just allowing, but empowering people to be able to tell, tell someone in this case, someone like me, who's really committed to contemplative silence and believes it's transformative and believes it's important to say, but this has been my experience of silence. So is that what you're trying to do to me? Or this is how I feel. This, this, is, this is what I feel is being done to me. But then to try to explore that, to ex explore the possibility and the limitations of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Pallavi, you have a hand up. Do you have a question? No, uh, yes, uh, kind of a question. I don't know how to frame it because some of your thoughts are really profound and First and foremost, I want to thank you for the uh, wonderful presentations. Um, I, I was particularly intrigued. I was thinking one, this idea of architectural silence or silence in a space. Um, and when as designers, as architects, when we start thinking about that, does the space actually recede or impose itself uh, when, when we're thinking of spa contemplative spaces? Um, the, some of the examples that you showed had the spatial component, Luis, uh, you know, where those aspects happen, uh, how important does architecture then become in defining a silence or does it have to withdraw? Um, then when looking at Andrew's presentation, this, we always say there is, you know, this particular architect has a language of his own, um, but is there a language of silence? Uh, very oxymoronic as it sounds. Is there an architecture of silence? Is there a, a language, architectural language of silence? As when I'm thinking about these things, I don't know, again, I'm not sure, Andrew, as you said, I don't know if I'm even making sense here, but um, I start to think of, Louis, your ideas about critical subjectivity. Um, but then when Andrew is showing these urban 
um, projects where there is this there is a collective position that we are taking. Uh, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit or about your thoughts on critical subjectivity, but um, also this idea of a collective position that we take, uh, and then probably Andrew, if you could also talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll have to you know, reflect on it more deeply later. But my initial thought on this is, I see what these architectural projects that Andrew presented are examples of critical subjectivity. And it's quite clearly dialogic. I mean, this is what I appreciate is like, the number of people that you're consulting and collaborating with to explore these new possibilities. Um, so I think one part is that another part would be just what we're exploring here with these questions of colonialism, inclusivity, exclusivity, who's being marginalized is, are we creating those kinds of spaces, right? So are we engaging in what I'm increasingly referring to as critical intersubjectivity? Um, so whose voices are being included, whose voices are being excluded? Should we go out and consciously seek out those voices that haven't been consulted? and hear how they experience it. And that's partly why I brought up the church bell example, um, because I, I find it as a kind of cognitive dissonance in my own in my own experience of space and time, just as Andrew was describing. I mean, in Boston and in San Diego, depending on where you are, it's telling you <laughs> the time, but it's also this kind of beautiful sound filling the landscape and you and the, but then at the same time you say, but it's coming from that place. Um, and that place has a certain kind of occupation of this region that has displaced other people. And in the sound being wrong, it is actually displacing me. It's reminding me, you aren't part of this tradition. Um, and so this is part of, I think, what critical subjectivity is. It's, it's not just us becoming more conscious, but it's being in dialogue with many other perspectives like we're doing today, that then might change our perspective on things or bring to our attention things that we hadn't considered that might have some kind of transformative effect. So, I mean, I think part of the reason I showed some of those spaces is to try to imagine a collective space that would be inclusive and that would be attentive to that. Well, how will you experience this space? So I think a non-Catholic experiencing St. Francis of Assisi shrine would be different than uh, somebody experiencing the Rothko Chapel, right? And then we can kind of think about that. But one of the reasons that I tried to juxtapose those two things is that for me, in terms of contemplative silence, both of those spaces are rooted in contemplative silence, but also facilitate contemplative silence. My experience of both of those spaces is that they actually bring people into contemplative silence by being there. In the St. Francis of Assisi Shrine, I mean, there were people from all over the world when we were there, pilgrims, but I think people who also were just tourists, quote unquote, no one was saying anything. They were all sitting in a shared collective space of silence together without thinking, well, I'm not you or you're not me or you're from this place or I'm from that place. Um, it was it was actually that kind of shared space. Interesting. I, yeah, I agree 100% with what Lewis was saying, certainly at the beginning of the of the discussion, and then I went into my own little mind map to sort of as a response to it, to some degree, this, this notion that there's a, a beauty, a kind of value, or not even a value, but a beauty in, in, in understanding these constructs, particularly the spatial constructs of the city and the fact that sound is part of that. So again, church bells, that's what's that's what's so evident within Western society now. And But then understanding that there's an inherent tension and that tension exists within us, right, within us as individuals individuals who are certainly me who's uh, uh, you know I, I, I'm called a settler I'm called a colonizer I'm, I was born in England I, I, I was an immigrant to Canada and the notions that on my partner uh, is actually someone of indigenous indigenous history and indigenous heritage and this notion that with the, these sensitivities these notions of inclusion are, are really important it's a big part of all our dialogues and a big part of the work we're being asked to do in the middle of cities right now so I think it's something that is a continual struggle I want to go to Pallavi's question about architecture's response to the notion of contemplative space. And I guess this is an easy one for me and I'm, I'm continually challenged, so I get to be easy. And also, I love the expression, you know, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this notion that to somebody who designs space, the answer, yes, of course, architecture is the answer to this into this question around contemplative space and that and that architecture can solve that problem to some degree. Implicit in that is that there's a whole bunch of understandings that 
the architecture that I think is important or the architecture that I think is a response to many of our conditions and not, you know, going much to a much more fundamental degree than say a response to the autistic, autistic experience or a response to the, the marginalized communities is an understanding that architecture can create a reduced palette in the same way that you can look at a Caravaggio and look at a Rothko. And I love the fact that the kind of sub thread of this conversation includes Mark Rothko. You can look at a Caravaggio and you can look at a Rothko and you can look at the possibilities within a Caravaggio and how you're drawn into certain narratives. But the possibilities when you look into a Rothko are completely much open, much wilder. There's that position where all of a sudden we understand abstraction and we understand the powers of abstraction. And then Rothko <coughs> creates, again, other artists too, but Rothko creates this work that allows us to disappear into it and disappear into ourselves simultaneously. So I think as we move into a modern art or, or a contemporary architecture, I think we can create spaces that have that same potential, that create frames for experience, that actually converge with landscape, converge with a city condition, converge with exterior, interior perspectives, but create a kind of, I don't want to say neutral, because you do, you do want to engender um, experience, you do want to engender reflection, but I think architecture can do that. And we are very much trying to do that in, in, certain, in certain ways and in certain projects. I gave a presentation uh, yesterday around a house called Casa Malaparte, which is a house built by Curzio Malaparte and Libra and Capri. And the idea of this, this building is a sequence of spaces. It's actually a sequence of seduction. It's, if you know the film Le Mépris or Contempt, it's the house that's used as a setting for. But essentially, you move through these spaces. And at the end, the last room, all it is is an aperture for the view to the ocean off the island of Capri. The architecture completely sub subsumes uh, becomes secondary to then the experience of that space. And if the experience that it's framing is one that can be seen as somehow co contemplative, then I think architecture can be a, to the benefit of contemplative experience. And I, and I, if I can just add one thing, I, a okay. lot of my own life and experience has actually been, you know, spent in the mountains. So when I think about space, a lot of times what I think about is the experience and also silence is the experience of the back country in the United States and deep into the back country of the United States and wilderness and mountains and these kinds of things. Um, and one of my favorite expressions is these kinds of massive roadless areas in the United States, right, referring to it as the big outside. And so what is it like when you go into the big outside and then come back inside urban landscapes? How do you think about urban landscapes from the point of view of wilderness or mountains and things like this? So I just wanted to add that, that a lot of my thinking reflection experience of silence is really a mountain based kind of contemplation where I see the relationship between mountains and and meditation as stillness based practice as having this overlap. That's very interesting. Thank you both. I, I just wanted to quickly also add, uh, when you talked about political silence in uh, Lewis, and then we are talking about colonization. And um, I, I think everybody thinks about this is colonization even over is still a job in progress in some form or the other, right? Um, in new tools or new strategies that come in uh, that are perceived as um, anti or you know, decolonizing, uh, but are they another form of colonization? Um, just yeah. a good point, Pallavi. Uh, I have a, just a comment and, and then a follow up question. We pose this question to both of you, you know, about talking about silence, right, and noise and sound and things like that. And for such, you know, such a, you know, kind of, you know, um, you know, interesting concept, you know, thing that didn't have any sort of tangibility, both of you responded with very concrete examples. So examples of how, you know, silence, noise, sound, and that sort of stuff could be made manifest, but through different modes of expression, you know, the poet uses words and, you know, dancers use dance movements and arts, you know, and, and architecture, you know, uses built form and space. So I'm just kind of curious to, you know, talk about this idea that we would have this, you know, a concept that, you know, seems quite nebulous. How would you 
you begin to express it. Yeah, both of you had no problems with assigning a particular vocabulary or demonstrating examples that use kind of a contextual vocabulary. How important is that sort of idea of translation from taking, you know, a large idea? Lewis is talking about, you know, um, you know, this idea of contemplative uh, um, space and then giving concrete examples. You know, Andrew is presenting these concrete examples and yet talking about conceptual ideas. Where do you kind of see this sort of, you know, um, crossover point between, you know, what can be conceptual, what can be actual, this idea of kind of context and then also expression. And just sort of both of your perspectives, you know, asking Lewis to step into more architecture than you know, uh, moving Andrew more into contemplative, how would you begin to, you know, wrestle with people, you know, with that sort of juxtaposition? Andrew, would you like to go? Uh, yeah, you know, um, we talk about language all the time and architects talk about language all the time because we really, we, we constantly recede into our own private little club of, of, of terms and, and, and uh, you know, understandings. But, you know, for me, it is very clear to me that almost everything we try to do as designers, as artists, because I work within the art world, I live within the art world, is it's a journey towards something. So we've, we'll never, like I think John Cage has proven in, in a couple of different ways that we'll never achieve silence. Uh, maybe the forest that Lewis is talking about, you can achieve something close to silence, or at least a silence where you're filtering everything that, that you don't want to, to, to have infecting your world. You can filter most of that out and you have a different, a different kind of noise. And architecture for me, or design generally, I like to talk about design and design research more than art architecture specifically, is about that, that journey and what you actually figure out along, what you learn along that journey around, around uh, uh, you know, and I learned this in, when I worked in theater. I used to be an actor when I worked in theater. We talked about Pinter and the Pinteresque pause, right? The idea that in, uh, in Beckett and in Pinter and some contemporary and some Dadaist work, the idea that the void, the space in between the words, is as important as the as the words that 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 sort of conjoin them, or the words that that that, that are that sort of link them, and the power of that void, particularly in Beckett, is is as it's a place in which the viewer, the observer, the audience, whoever it is, or the reader, even when you're reading it and you understand there should be a pause in between those two words, and this is what I appreciated about Lewis's um, poetry readings. Is that, is, that, is that that becomes something that's equally powerful. And for me, as a, somebody who works within architecture and design, it's actually trying to create an architecture where those pauses, where that nothingness, that emptiness, that, that void is actually a component of the spatial experience. So that's what I'm learning, uh, I think, implicitly from other worlds. And that's why I answer Pallavi's uh, uh, question around whether architecture is part of the solution to this thing. It's, it's where we don't create architecture or we create the architecture of the kind of, you know, the word in architecture is the interstitial and that has a kind of technical space. But I don't mean it in the interstitial sense. I mean it in the sort of non-space sense or unspace sense. The fact that this void has as much meaning and in fact, more meaning in some cases, more meaning in terms of what's not there, more meaning in you know, minimalist art, you know, it has lots of worlds, more meaning in the sense that there's less in the work of Donald Judd, less in one of his sculptures than there is in the landscape around one of his sculptures. And that's that's meaningful. That's a kind of silence to me, but it's one that's intellectually layered and it's one that talks to you about the relationship between those objects. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, but for me, it's it's as an actor, when I was working as an actor, it was something that I reveled in. I would I would expand the Pinterest pauses or I expand those moments in in Beckett where you actually make them almost uh, almost. Uh, you know, almost painful to some degree, like when listening to 431 or 436, the uh, cages, four I know uh, Lewis knows the exact number. I'm not 433. 433. <laughs> so I, you know, again, there's that. There's a, well, there was a pause between 431 and 433. Right, exactly. I you, you added the space in between. Yeah, that's right. I, those two <laughs> seconds are the ones that are really important to me. Anyway, the, uh, this, this notion that it's almost painful to listen to that piece. And, and because you, because there's something about our persona, something about our world that, it, that it, you know, if we're in a, a John Pawson hallway and we understand that nothing is happening other than that construct, then it almost has the same degree of, of really, uh, really enjoyable pain. 
But Andrew, quickly, what, what uh, triggered those words that you had in the last part of your presentation when you had the fragments and there were like words like transition, if I remember, or wired threshold? Uh, those yeah, it, it's an attempt to create a, a kind of, uh, I mean, it really is an attempt to create an accessible language that talks about how we create architecture. So we can create a space and we can say, this is the beautiful space. Or you can start to, because we're working with people who are non-architects and we're working with people and we're trying to understand that we're creating a kind of systematized response, a method. Like we're always trying, this is what I say to my thesis students, you're not creating a project, you're actually creating a method, right? Or a process or something that you can actually take something from. So within field work, we're actually trying to do that. We're trying to try understand each project is a laboratory and that laboratory then has architectural words and components. In that, those cases in particular, there, there are words that we've chosen that actually can be responded to in the notion of spatial silence. We can actually reduce the idea of threshold to that space that exists between one space and another. And how can you talk about it as a pure threshold, something that just talks about that moment of transition and rather, the, rather than being inundated with a plethora of sort of visual stimuli or oral stimuli or whatever it is, it gives you that moment to experience that. It's like when you have an intellectual threshold, an epiphany of sorts, and you talk about the threshold as a moment of epiphany, not through visual stimuli or anything, but through a pause. The threshold becomes like a Pinterest pause, and you can actually take it and then say, now I'm going to go into that next space. So those words are ways of talking about it in a way that, that, uh, that, that, that we hope is something we can learn from, and then something whoever's engaging in the work can learn from. Is that, a, is that an okay answer? Or? Where you're looking for something deeper. Brilliant. I get the impression everybody hears. I'm not able to respond with the depth and nuance that everybody wants to get out of this conversation. But I hope I'm. I think we. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's true, Andrew. I think you're <laughs> yeah. giving us a very, very good understanding, you know, of how this applies in architecture, right? Which is your area of expertise, and then Lewis's understanding, you know, of contemplative studies, and you know, in the discussions that we've had about, you know, it being a very sort of, you know, um, his introducing contemplative studies book is a, you know, kind of a theoretical sets of guidelines. And it's like, okay, how does this come into practice? And yet when charged with, you know, delivering, you know, presentation on, you know, contemplative studies, mindfulness and things like that. Both of you have given concrete examples. You're able to make that transition. You're able to bridge it. So this isn't something that exists just to thinking. This is something that can be actually enacted and it can actually find expression through different modes and different medias. So Lewis, can you maybe talk a little bit about that sort of, you know, first the conceptualization of the idea and then the sort of, you know, the expression that, you know, you were, you were presenting? Yeah, I mean, I'm aware of the time, so I just want to <laughs> note that. Um, I'm also aware that John has a question I think some of you might be able to answer in an interesting way. Uh, but I, I think I'll just make a few comments um, in the interest of time. So one is the traditions that I study the most and the tradition that I'm located in, there's a really strong emphasis on formlessness. So my part of my way of understanding form is form emerging from formlessness, which also kind of obviously connects to certain kinds of theological and cosmogonic ideas, but the formed or the form emerging from formlessness and returning to formlessness. So in fact, you know, when you think about Taoist cosmogony, the way the universe came to be, the primary explanation or description is, well, there was a beginning. There was a beginning, not yet beginning to be a beginning. There was a beginning not yet beginning to be a beginning and it just goes on and on right so part of this is a Taoist joke and part of this is to say you're a human being you actually don't know but there was something before all of this and that might have been nothing we don't know what it is so one part of it i think is locating form inside of the formless or locating the kind of um built inside of emptiness or locating sound inside of silence rather than thinking somehow sound is the primary and silence is the secondary or so, like i said at the beginning of the talk that silence is somehow the absence of sound rather than it's the field in which sound is occurring but i think the other part of this is and this is where i think contemplative practice becomes really profound and transformative is there are certain kinds of practices that actually do lead to a kind of absorb absorption state where it is complete silence so for people that haven't had this experience it might sound conceptual, it might sound hypothetical, 
it might sound impossible, but in fact, it's completely possible. So from a phenomenological and what Pallavi was asking about critical subjectivity, when we describe the experience of consciousness, there are states of emptiness that are completely absent of content. On a phenomenological level, this is simply a fact. I mean, I can describe it, I can describe moments when I've had this experience. So that is, there are contemplative methods or contemplative practices that facilitate the experience of what you might call absolute emptiness or absolute silence. Um, what's interesting, and this is where it gets complicated, and I know I, I'm actually speaking more than I said I would, but I just want to say a couple things about this, because I think it's really important for contemplative studies and actually the contemplative approach we're talking about, is that in that space, you know, you will, on a, on a phenomenological level, you will hear sound. So the kind of common reaction to this is subject-object relationships. Silence, sound is outside myself, silence is inside myself. But one of the ways that you find the resolution to this paradox is when you expand into the silence encompassing all of the sound, into that field that's outside of yourself. So this is a kind of like trans um, local or um, transpersonal kind of state as I would describe it. And the last thing I would say, which relates to the formless and the formed is, you know, there's this great Taoist saying, you know, names are the guest of reality, right? And so it's like, okay, but there, we do use naming and we do use language. And I think one of the points of this, just like uh, my joke about, you're really gonna give a talk on contemplative silence, so I was like, well, if I were being a real performance artist, it would have been 20 minutes of silence, right? But how do you communicate these kinds of experiences with people in such a way where it might awaken some possibility in them, you know, inspire them to explore something? So like, I think that's what's great about some of the um, projects Andrew's working on and presented is, oh, wow, you could actually do that. And this is one of the things that, that for me has come out of the Mindful Modernism's webinar series is all of the possibilities that I didn't know about with creativity and imagination, like that there's like conceptual architecture that's never going to be built. It's like, wow, that makes sense. You know, why does it make sense? Because from a contemplative perspective, this might be what you do, <laughs> right? Um, you actually create cognitive architecture um, or architectural design that, that changes the way you look at things. Um, so that's that's what I have to say at the moment. Yeah, very insightful, thank you. I'd like to move on and just read a question that we got um, from uh, John Rossini. Uh, thank you, John, thanks for coming back. Um, he has a comment and then a question. He says, thank you for these rich and generative talks. They invite reflection upon the character of the contemplative architect. So uh, following up on that, can we speak of such a notion, i.e. the contemplative architect? If so, uh, then what is the ethos of the mindful architect? Is it about one who embodies a contemplative practice and is practiced in silence? Thanks, John. Anybody want to talk about that? I think both of you can contribute to this in meaningful ways. Andrew? Um, I mean, I'm, gonna do, I'm not going to do this question uh, 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 in, in a service at all, I guess, but I, but I will try to, you know, I'm not the contemplative architect, right, for sure. I mean, I'm immersed in this plethora. The only time I find moments of silence is, well, actually, I don't even remember the last time I managed to find a moment of silence. Um, and that's okay. I live in that world, and that's the world I choose to live in. And, uh, you know, maybe on a motorcycle riding through the forest on a curvy road where you're actually just concentrating on staying alive, and there's all kinds of stuff going on around you, but you're so focused that you have those moments. But there are architects that I think build on this notion. You know, there's an architect called Peter Zumtor who works out of Switzerland who I, I would suggest, and I don't know, he may just be some crazy punk kind of minimalist, but I think he has a he has a kind of an ethos, I guess, is if that's the word, yeah, I guess that's the word, that if I were to apply what I think, how mindfulness would find its way into a practice of architecture, not so much a way of being in the world, but, a, but, but something that applies to the way in which we make work and, the, and the, 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 the projects that emerge, I would suggest that that may be mindful in the sense that it's very mindful of very intensified and a minimal 
uh, uh, understanding of certain qualities, whether it's material qualities, whether it's three ways in which a, a piece of stone meets a piece of stone, whether it's the way in which objects are positioned in the landscape and create a kind of understanding of that landscape. So I would suggest that there's a difference between the contemplative architect and the contemplative architectural practice. The contemplative architect, I have no idea. The contemplative architectural practice, yes, I think you can look at certain practices that lend themselves at least in a way, at least in an imagined way, and in a way you think these practices might be forming that, 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 that has something for what I understand to be a, a contemplative understanding of the world. I would love to be able to say that maybe throughout, you know, I'll be able to transition into something that gives that kind of uh, nuanced under, nuanced thoughtfulness to design solutions and be able to have the, I wouldn't say the luxury, but certainly the focus of that, you know, as I move, you know, into, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm almost 30. So it's like, you know, time is moving. So there's like this notion that, the, that, that there's a place, I think there's a place, everybody says also that architects never retire and that you really only achieve a kind of degree of of expertise when you're quite older. So that's where Zumtor is, I think. And he can actually say this. Uh, anyway, so I would say that there's a notion of a, a contemplative architectural practice. And you can see in certain works that that exists. Good, I agree. Thank you. Lewis, what, how would you respond? Well, as you know, I'm not an architect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a little challenging, but I, I mean, I'd say a couple things. I mean, one is, um, I think through these webinars, we start to, one, find examples of what I think reasonably can be talked about as contemplative, contemplative design, um, also maybe contemplative approaches to design. I mean, this is part of why I did the contemplative riffing, you know, and sampling is this is what I kind of got as a non-architect, quote unquote, from these talks is the, the possible contribution of a contemplative approach to design, but also that kind of design into feeding into contemplative studies, which is one of the main reasons, as you know, that, I mean, I'm interested in this collaboration is I never imagined my contemplative studies book being applied to interior design, architecture, and it's like exciting because I do see imagination and creativity as an essential part of this. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say about this question is, um, using the approach to develop that kind of application right so so exploring it exploring this question as a kind of contemplative inquiry um and and imagining what's possible and i think one thing that comes up for me is the question of the even though i said and this is what i believe that one of the essential defining characteristics of con a contemplative approach and contemplative practice is silence there is this question of is contemplative silence the primary state or quality or condition that we're attempting to cultivate? Because there are many states, there are many modes. So one thing I think about with this question is, yes, silence might be essential, but maybe developing deeper listening. So that would be the mindful attentive dimension of it is, um, and we saw this in some of the previous presentations and I think Andrew's too, of oh, we are listening to uh, an environment that was already there, whatever that environment is, and then developing the skill set to listen to that multi-layered reality, and then whatever it is we're doing, um, being informed by that experience. Right. And one of the things that I think, you know, has been at the uh, center of, you know, our investigations through the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats is expanding the definition of what mindfulness, what contemplative studies is. And one of Lewis's you know, proposals is that, you know, we look at this sort of interdisciplinary engagement, right, about expanding about how we could begin to take these approaches and have them executed in different disciplines in different arenas, and then see exactly, you know, how this would actually play out. And as one of our goals here is to kind of create that dictionary or that thesaurus or whatever to kind of 
you know, expand these terms to make them more inclusive. And, you know, we may have had preconceptions about what mindfulness or contemplative studies is, you know, before coming to the series or even just, you know, in discussion, but we walk away with maybe a greater, you know, awareness of the possibilities about how we could maybe expand the definition, right? Andrew may not think of himself as a mindful designer, yet I think, you know, through Lewis's observations, we could definitely demonstrate that you have mindful tendencies, right? But you just don't call yourself that, but you're doing things that are in the same flavor of the things, you know, that Lewis is looking at in contemplative studies. So there's a synergy and probably it's just a matter of you know, kind of correcting terms or, you know, getting on the same page in, in terms of discussion. So yeah, I wanted gonna, to thank both of you. I'm going to add that to oh, my, go ahead. Yeah, please. I'm going to add that to my business card for sure. Like it's below <laughs> the design principle. And if I can just say one thing very, very quickly. Yeah, please. This notion yeah. of political space and this, and, and Lewis talked about it in one of our early conversations in a little bit today. And this notion that we are, we seem to be in my, in my opinion, seem to be getting so constrained around definitions. And if there's anything that mindfulness and contemplative strategies within any discipline can do, it's the ability to step back, reflect, understand your place, and then open up these conversations. I think almost, it goes without saying that almost any thinking person will, will say, we need to expand these conversations around it because they seem to be radically contracting. They seem to be radically sort of converging into a kind of unfortunate siloization and unfortunate silencing, the, the, the silencing in, a, in, an, in an unpositive way. And I think that we've got to, we've got to, that, that's this is me and anyway we have to somehow crack that open and I think contemplative strat within architecture can do that so I, I really appreciate this. this is a fascinating conversation I absolutely love this and Kurt if I can Thank just you. add I think one thing that sure. formal contemplative practice really does is gives us the ability to um, manage um, discomfort so I think one thing that you learn from deep contemplative practice is there's going to be tension and there's going to be discomfort and you learn how to include that in your practice and the deeper your practice becomes the more discomfort you can include and so therefore that also has a kind of social application an applied lived practical application of oh yes this is making me really uncomfortable yeah that's fine right rather than it kicking you out of your practice or kicking you out of your right. presence or saying i've got to get out of this now it's like no i can i can encompass this i can include this and i think that has a, a political and a social application to it right the probably yeah, I... of ideas very much so this idea that you know you know through lewis's work and through andrew's you know work that we get a sense of what the possibilities could be right new opportunities to say we don't have to think of things in one particular way we don't have to go by one definition we can you know if we approach it you know from uh you know a, a very quite a contemplative and mindful um point of view we're able to see possibilities right and potentials and ways in which we can begin to integrate these things into you know whatever discipline we're, we're involved in we're in particular interested in design, but I think as we're demonstrating, our designers are thinking outside of, you know, just buildings and boxes. We're talking about, you know, our lives and, you know, our humanity and our existence, right? It becomes part and parcel, you know, of our identity and then also how we act in the world. I have to be mindful of the time. Um, I know we've gone on for quite some uh, time here, and I think we could probably keep going, which would be really great. But I think we should probably wrap things up. So what I'd like to do is just ask both of our presenters for their final remarks, and then we'll end the session. So, Lewis, do you have any uh, closing remarks you'd like to make? I'll just say thank you very much for the opportunity. It was great being here, and I really appreciated Andrew's presentation. It's a lot to think about. Um, and as a series as a whole, it's been really great and interesting to kind of see the various expressions of this possibility. Thank you, Liz. Andrew? I'll, I'll keep mine equally short and, and the same appreciations to, to, to you for organizing, you and your group, Kurt, to organizing this, the, this, uh, this talk and uh, really testing my boundaries. I will say that uh, I'm going to be buying Lewis's books. That's for sure. There's nine of them. So the first thing that I'm going to buy, though, as as somebody who often says, uh, my moments of mindfulness have actually come from being around animals, specifically being around horses, specifically being around one or two different horses. So the the last book on the uh, on the taming of horses is going to be one of my first purchases. I often say I'd much rather be around 
that entity than many of the human entities that are in my world. And it is the thing that brings me, uh, if anything, a certain amount of uh, uh, empathy, uh, humility, and, and I guess to some degree mindfulness. So thank you. And I look forward to reading the book. Okay, thank you to you both. And thanks to everybody for participating. And um, I hope you enjoyed uh, this week's session. Um, this will wrap up our first phase of our presentations for uh, the uh, Mindful Moderns webinar. So we've done the first four and then we will be taking a break over the, um, uh, the holiday season and we'll be resuming back in January. So please check out our website for the future upcoming lectures. And again, big thanks to Lewis and Andrew for participating in today's wonderful discussion. That concludes our session for today. Thank you all very much and hopefully we'll see you all in the new year. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you Andrew and Luis. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks guys. Bye.